Happening now, we want to welcome our viewers in the United States and around the world. My name is Jason Neifer, and you're in the EdTech Situation Room. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. I'm so excited we're actually here, and we have the guru of EdTech in all, not just San Antonio, but Texas. He's known around the world world as the man who sets himself on fire at times to get some good conversations going it's miguel Gulen. i i feel like that is so left over you know carrie ross is now in san antonio i mean and uh shelly sanchez terrell is in san antonio everybody's moving to san antonio so it's just i it's so le and then uh, the girl who set herself on fire you know the hunger games thing so wes you need to oh, come wow. up with a new oh. intro Okay, we'll work on that. All right, Thanks. well, before we get into our, our question and answer, well, not our question and answer, talking about our news, um, I'm going to just throw this curveball at you guys. You know, the B side, Marco Torres does this and Tammy Parks does, your A side is your education side. So you, you, we got to go around real quick and say what you're doing on your day job. Uh, and then you're going to say a B side fact or story about just something on your week. And that, that can't be anything connected to your, your day job. So I am still the educational, well, the technology director of Cassidy School in Oklahoma City, um, and I'll throw it up to Jason. I am the assistant director and curriculum director of the Montana Digital Academy, the state virtual school in uh, located in fabulous Missoula, Montana. I'm also the tech savvy administrator for the Northwest Council for Computer Education. Miguel yeah. Gulen, I'm currently the uh, director of technology operations for uh, smaller urban school district 10,000 students in the San Antonio Texas area and uh, are we doing the B story now or or is that sure, later yeah, you, you, you can go B side right now just lay it on us okay so uh, w w what were the instructions again you know I'm not very good with this well, audio thing no, that's, that's that's okay I'll do B side first it's just Thanks. a fact or story from your from your week um, that doesn't have to do with your job okay great because people want to know you Miguel they want to know the real Miguel Gulen. Well, I, I use icons to and real fake pictures from many years ago. You know, I. Okay, so that a B makes, story. Let me let me uh, just come right out and and share a story. Um, it was it was. Uh, I, I don't have anything to share, uh, Wes. I I don't have a life. You know. <laughs> All right. My, uh, okay, I'll go. I don't normally have thanks. a cross on my head, but yeah, we did have. Uh, it is very distracting. I'm, I know. I'm teaching third grade uh, uh, Wednesday night, and uh, we we drew. This was awesome. <clears throat> My wife had this idea. We asked for whiteboards, so uh, the kids drew what we were talking about in our lesson, and we took pictures and we used Shadow Puppet, and they recorded. And so we're being all geeky. We actually have an Apple TV in this like media room where we meet, so we'll play our Shadow Puppet movie. And yeah, I was. That's what I was doing tonight. So my, my B story would be that uh, um, after trying seven or eight times to get past the first season, I, I something monumental happened this past weekend. I finally got through all six seasons of The Sopranos only 10 years after the last episode aired. So I now get all the popular culture references that many of my <laughs> HBO loving friends have been referring to for the last decade or so. So I feel like I finally am accomplished on that very important fact. So. That is awesome. All right, Miguel. I, 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 still, B -side. I, I, I still don't have one. I, I'm so sorry. I know I won't be invited back, but it's okay. No, I'm, okay. I'm okay I'll, go, I'll go for you. It's okay. We roll with the punches here at uh, yeah. the EdTech Situation Room. <laughs> if you ever need to get information from Miguel Gulen, here is what you need to do. Take him to Chili's and buy a large chocolate shake because he will tell you lots of great educational technology tips for chocolate shakes. And that is a fact, my friends. I've, I've had to give those up. I'm now on protein shakes. And, uh, oh, there we go. I can talk about protein shakes. Why didn't you say that before? Yes, I'm now doing protein shakes, uh, plant-based protein shakes. Anybody in the audience doing protein shakes? Okay. We're about to lose half our audience. No, I'm just uh, Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> At All least right. Peggy's well, so still here. Peggy's still here. That's good. Chris Worley's back. Chris is back again. Yes. Okay, well, so our format is basically we have a Google Doc of news items, and we're just going to kind of kick it around for anybody who is in our in our um, or whatever we are, our roundtable, to uh, throw, throw out a topic, an article, share your thoughts, and then we'll let everybody kind of respond, and we'll just sort of go from there. So, Jason, do you, do you want to kick it off with one of the yeah. articles first? 
Sure. Um, I we've been kind of tossing this around a couple of times. The the last couple of episodes related to um, uh, our various thoughts about Apple's uh, uh, first quarter profits and sales and yada yada yada. But the a, a lesser known story that's an important part of this that I think does have a broader impact on education is that Alphabet, which is what Google uh, is is kind of sort of called, they're the now the um, the company that owns Google, they split apart into different parts and Alphabet, the larger company that owns the sub companies, which includes Google, has now surpassed Apple as the world's most valuable company. And what that means is if you take all the stock that's issued on Google and add a price of the stock, its market cap, as it's called, has exceeded Apple's market cap. And of course, that's really interesting. Over the last uh, uh, four or five years, Apple has dominated uh, the number one field, taking over from, I think, an oil company uh, a few years ago. And now that Google, um, despite the reorganization, has surpassed Apple in its market cap, um, that suggests that despite the fact that search uh, used to be its, its primary method of, of, of gaining um, economic means, they're diversifying appropriately to stay relevant in uh, 2016's, 2016's tech field. So any thoughts about Google's dominance and maybe where they're going as a more diversified company? You bet. Oh, wait. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> you, you sort of slipped it right in there, Jason. I, I missed it. Say it again. Yeah. The, any thoughts about Google's diversification, especially now in light of the fact that they are the world's most valuable company, and if that diversification and they're they're uh, moving away from the focus of of search and onto other ventures, if that has any uh, impact on the educational technology field or or maybe even the personal technology we all use. I'll I'll field an answer while the girl collects his thoughts. Uh, we were we're talking digital citizenship at our school, and we're in the process. I will not reveal early because we've got some press releases and things coming, but <clears throat> exciting speakers coming. And uh, I had a chance to talk in our upper division chapel on Monday because of some things that happened with Twitter last week and some polls. Um, we're talking also <laughs> not only about appropriate use, but we're also talking about knowing, you know, are you the product? And we were, this is literally in the administration meeting today, um, you know, how perceptions have shifted and young people are less concerned about this idea that they are the product and that, you know, on web shows or, you know, YouTube videos, that the, the whole monetization of being online and your information being sold. Um, you know, Older folks tend to be more upset about this. Younger people seem to be kind of like, meh, you know, they're not that worried about it. Um, it has practical, you know, relevance in some of our urban districts. I think I mentioned this in a one, one of our two earlier shows <clears throat> that we had a district um, actually had their board voted not to go Google Apps because of the concern over privacy issues, you know, and fear about Google being this monolith that's going to, you know, invade all our privacy and get all our information and, and, and become the evil Microsoft, become the evil that Microsoft was in the 90s, you know, here now. So I, I, uh, I continue to enjoy, t you know, drinking the Google Kool-Aid and, and enjoying all those tools. Uh, having hung out with different Googlers, I actually do think that the culture of Google has been one where they, they don't want to do evil. They're in the, the business of marketing and selling ads. And so there's going to be natural appropriation and use of information and there are going to be lines for them to walk. But, you know, from what I've read and, and, and in ISTE, I think they were doing updates about this last year. <clears throat> they are, you know, stripping out a lot of that stuff in the Google Apps for Education products. Uh, they're not just lining up the kids to, you know, strip them of all their information and sell it. And, you know, that is what they're about. But uh, I, I still feel very comfortable dancing the dance with Google and I'm happy to see them succeeding. Um, I don't want to see companies go the way of Posturus and Cinch and other companies, you know, that didn't find out how to monetize themselves. And then they went away and their content went away. So I'm still happy dancing the dance. But what about you, Miguel? <laughs> I I think it's great. I I think uh, we are too afraid. You know, back in the old days, we would be all concerned about uh, this company monopolizing everything. Let's just go ahead and and see what happens. I mean, we're human beings. Things are going to happen. We're just going to have to deal with them. Let's just open it up. It's sort of like uh, YouTube and schools are opening up the internet 
in, in our schools. Let's not block and lock things down. Let's let it open up. Let's have those real conversations that haven't been happening or, or have been happening. And, and now, thank goodness, we can reap the benefits. What's a denial of service attack every once in a while from a student who's learning? Because it's about growing, right? It's about growing. And that's what's happening. Google is growing. And Alphabet is a part of that. And the, you know, Apple will will crumble and fall in time, and so will Google. But in a thousand years, there will be some other company, Alphabet, that that rules it all. It might be Fryer. It might be Jason. I don't know how to say your last name. It might be Jason. You know, Knifer. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Thanks. That reminds me of the Wi-Fi pineapple. Do you guys know what this is? Yeah. You know, this, it's this, a, it's, that's what it's lets a, you uh, like a, a router. router. Yeah. It's a hacker device that, yeah, you you buy for a script kitty device that can let you launch all these different kinds of attacks. We learned it at a Meraki workshop that Cisco put on, you know, because anyway, kids are doing these things. And so anyway, that made me think of it talking about kids hacking openness, you know, things being closed. I don't know. J Jason, are you open the door? Yeah, you you guys are. You're, you've been Google Apps at, for Montana Digital yeah, Academy. Yeah, it, it allowed us right? to roll out an email system in 2010 without um, knowing what we were doing, basically. I mean, I, I was put into kind of a proto-tech proto director role, having been a classroom teacher that, you know, may have run um, off-the-books Linux servers in my classroom for the previous 10 years before I, I took this position. But um, I didn't know. I mean, we didn't really have the means to set up a, an Outlook server or an Exchange server or any of the things we needed to do. So Google Apps for Education allows us to roll out an, an, an email server for what is now serving um, uh, 6,000 people a year in the state of Montana with, you know, uh, 15 clicks. And then we were up and good to go. So for us, there was really no other option. But I think that there, it, and I'm starting to get more and more into the topic because what I find funny about criticism related to to Google is that I just don't know how Apple or Microsoft or some of the the uh, A minus and B tier companies that are servicing schools, uh, individuals, private citizens, how they're any different. I mean, I think they're all. Um, you know, trying to make a buck. And these are ways, popular tools to do so. If you have a Facebook account, you're being aggressively mined for your information. It's just the way the system works. And you know, as you mentioned earlier, Wes, if you don't know what they're selling, it means you're the product um, and you're being ultimately sold to someone else. But I, I think the point that, that you make, Wes, is most important in that um, I think educators love free stuff. I mean, it's what drives uh, uh, marketers at ISTE and, and conferences. And, um, you know, we utilize a lot on the free web and that's not funded through magic. I mean, there has to be something there that has an economic model. Uh, the tool that I was most, uh, uh, sorry, I have to put a cat on my lap here. Um, it's very Dr. Evil of me. If you, have if you have animals that you can bring into the mix, Miguel, it's just another bonus feature that we provide for I, I've audience. got a teacup poodle downstairs. I, I, I'll uh, see if we can bring it up, but he, he'll have to go to the groomer first. <laughs> Next show. Yeah. Um, uh, several years ago, I was in a, a, a socially classroom environment where we utilized JCut, which was a web-based uh, video editor because we were on some um, uh, computers that they couldn't really um, uh, handle a more modern um, uh, video editor. And it was great until they announced mid project that they were shutting down in, in 30 days. Um, and, you know, export your video now. Um, you know, it's, it's been really great, but we don't have a, a, a funny mechanism, yada, yada, yada. And, and the reality is, is that we need to start thinking in terms of what are we exchanging to get access to these tools. And in a world where micro payments are not working, and of course, journalism provides us the ultimate evidence that that's not the case, um, small subscription, uh, services, uh, paywalls have not really provided the income that most of these websites had hoped. Um, that, that means we got to pay for it somehow. And I'm not entirely sure that trading my data away is, is necessarily a, a, an exchange I always want to make, but we have to be cognizant of that. And I think it's very encouraging that Google wants to distract um, uh, kind of its, its core business, search business, in, in terms of other businesses it could profit from, whether it's driverless cars or um, uh, uh, space ventures or something I'm excited about, the contact lens that measures your blood sugar um, to not you know, pinprick my finger four times a day would be super awesome. Um, but you know, I think those are all uh, an ultimate benefit to, you know, uh, to the world that will bring them profits later. So I think it's just part of the business that we need to be comfortable with. 
So we don't have to do station identification because we're not broadcasting on any F FCC regulated uh, uh, platform. But if you have not gone to edtechsr.com, that is our website where we have links to the show notes that we will ostensibly be talking about today. There's your Scrabble word. You get a, you get a free Scrabble word every time you tune in to our show. Um, and <clears throat> we'll also, we'll, we'll be having some geek of the week links and who knows, we may, we may, may go down a rabbit hole and add some, some different links that aren't even on here, but uh, any more Google Apple thoughts? Would you like to go on the record, Miguel, and and say something extremely outlandish? I, I think Apple's dead, and uh, I don't know why why we went down this road with iPads. You know, when I started. Are you on an iPad right now or not? Now, just admit that. No, I'm on a MacBook Air. Oh, okay. I thought you got your iPad. No out. way. Sorry. Okay. It's an All iPad right. third Sorry. generation. I'm not planning to to upgrade unless maybe it's an iPad Pro. Have you seen how wonderful it is to write on those things? That that's not I an iPad played, Pro, Jason. That I've that's looks like a those. mini actually, but uh, actually I'm that's what I'm a huge. Season so season. I'm 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 seven foot nine, four hundred fifty pounds. This actually is an iPad Pro, <laughs> so it just looks so <laughs> tiny in my hands because of my sheer size. So I got it. You're Conan. Okay. So. Yeah, the pencil is pretty slick. I mean, we played with it at the Apple Store a little bit. Um, been wondering if that's going to be the replacement. Are we going to reach that point where no more laptop or just, you know, this is all we need? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's going to be the Chromebook. I love the Chromebook. Typing, great in the classroom. It is the one-to-one -one device. I was uh, walking uh, classrooms uh, at multiple schools over the last few days, and one thing I noticed was the uh, all the desktops were pretty much sitting unused, except for maybe a few, in very few classrooms. But in every classroom where we had one-to-one -one with iPads, they were all in use. So yeah. I think the lesson there is one-to-one -one, uh, works whether it's going to be iPads or Chromebooks or something else, we just need to have all those devices in kids' hands. Well, and it's a, we're in a multi-device world, yeah. right? I mean, it's, I mean, literally four devices here. Jason's got 20 <laughs> devices that he uses regularly. It's, uh, we're, no one is one-to-one -one as an adult who has the means to have multiple devices. No one has settled on one. Who, who put the article, Google opens the online store for books that, was that me. can't be printed? Yep, that was me. that one in, Jason? You want to talk a little bit about that one? I mean, it's a subtopic. Yeah, it's, it's an example where I think Google's trying to innovate. Whether we want them to innovate in this direction or not, um, uh, it, 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 the question remains to, to be answered. But Google is experimenting with something they're called editions at play, which are books that exist only on a mobile device. In other words, the content's not available um, it, it, via a print means or by other platforms, it's available only on the Google architecture. And what I saw here, well, I had two minds about it. The first one is that that's very interesting. I like that someone is playing with the notion of publishing information on a mobile friendly device. Um, I think that, that, that few people have taken on that mission short of apps that, that share other people's data, but like, what do you do to present an idea or a, a series of thoughts in a book form on a mobile device? But then I started thinking more deeply about this. And, and speaking of Apple, this is almost what um, the um, iBook maker um, on, on Apple does. It locks you into a platform that makes a book less useful than it would be otherwise. And, and you know, I was really, really thrilled about the iBooks maker when it first came out because it was such a beautiful platform that was very easy to put together, great multimedia books that only work on one device. And, and um, you know, it effectively locked them in to schools. It's the most elegant thing available for doing that, but it only works inside of a, a certain architecture. And while I'm glad Google is working on that concept of, of books that are more uh, aimed at, at smaller handheld device, I don't know if it does us any good to publish in something that is not universal uh, across a series of apps, especially when kids are more and more bringing their own device inside of uh, um, uh, their schools. Amen, Jason. I, I definitely agree with you. Uh, I, I really can't imagine why any business would go proprietary, especially now. We really need more open um, communication or open uh, type solutions that are going to enable us to connect and share with other people. I do not want to show kids how to create and then 
lock all their content up. You know, when I hear a, uh, like the state of Texas or someone else or, or any organization or any school district say, yeah, let's create all this iTunes content. We're going to put it in there. And I'm thinking, okay, now you've got to have an iPad. You've got to have some kind of iDevice. Why bother? Let's put it out on the open web, Google Sites. So, I mean, open educational resources. Give me a break. This is one of the most important Mardi Gras floats for us all to get on as educators. You know, advocacy platforms, seriously, is the, the idea of open sharing and open access. And I love Apple, okay? I don't want, you know, I don't know. I say things sometimes when people get upset because they're like, he doesn't love Apple anymore. I do. I love it. I'm using my iPad right now. But <clears throat> I do not think that Apple has been on the correct page with the cloud in the same way that Google has. So I've been creating on Google Sites for years. I look at digital tools uh, as like places to make digital investments. And so with our teachers right now, I'm helping several, you know, set up um, websites on, on Google sites. I don't think it's going to go away for a while. Um, Apple continues to just kind of shift their cloud strategy and mobile me goes away. And, you know, these other things in the cloud go away. Um, the whole idea of creating high quality educational content and sharing it generously is awesome. And if you haven't seen the one great thing series on iTunes U that Apple Distinguished Educators have created, I mean, there's phenomenal stuff there. Problem, it's only within that platform. And so I think uh, we just need to be continuing to push, you know, our, our peers and the folks we work with, tech companies to say it's not a good idea to just put stuff in, you know, within one container that's going to, that's going to limit because we are not going to, I'm sorry, have every parent and every child, oops, we lost Miguel, um, on the same, on the same platform. It's just, it's just not going to happen. My passion darkened Miguel's screen and destroyed. I melted his camera. Maybe well, we'll come back. And, and I think your kids are watching <laughs> Netflix again because, uh, your voice, uh, started doing that, uh, that strange quavering thing. But, um, uh, but I, ha I have to say, um, I can't, I, is it, oh, I forgot her first name, but it's C. Chauces, Chases, um, posted a great article in the uh, thing that says that Apple has opened it up. But, you know, Apple has opened up a lot of things recently. Why has it done that? Why has it done that? Why is it, you know, why is it releasing a new OS, what is it, 9.3, that's going to change things and allow for multi-user why has it done all those things? Because it's losing. It's on the ropes. Do you remember the arrogance, the arrogant Apple people saying, oh, yeah, that, we don't need to do that. We want everybody to uh, invest in uh, <laughs> disposable. <laughs> Sorry, Wes. See, I know your family, so I know their voices. Uh, okay, so it's on her phone, so she's being falsely accused. Sorry. This is a twenty. That's right. Twenty first century problem. Yes, you you have. Uh, tell her to get off Boxer too. Okay. So, uh, uh, <laughs> um, so it, it's like uh, finally they're they're coming around and being sensible, bringing out all these sensible solutions, and and we'll use that article that was just shared in the chat as as yet another example of how important it is to. Uh, what what do, you, what do you call? I'm not up to date on economy or economics and stuff, but. Uh, capitalist society mark free market you know i'm going back to high school here but because of the competition we're not apple is finally waking up and providing to its users what they've wanted all along from it will that make it a better organization you bet okay sorry it's like wes has checked out no, <laughs> just when couldn't, I just he couldn't when take I it Char charlene so, was with us that, and she <laughs> sent that article link and when i click it i think i went dark so Okay, okay, I'm going to defend Apple here. You did. Apple has had this focus since the iPhone. And I was there, by the way, in 2007 in San Francisco. Steve announced it on the stage. Little did we know. Uh, they've, they have been mainly consumer focused, right? Because that is where the dollars has been. And they've continued to make adjustments. I mean, 9.3 looks like it's going to be a great uh, move in the direction of Google Classroom. I mean, we fundamentally have to answer some questions as long as we're in traditional school, like how do I turn this in to my teacher? And that has been really hard to do on the iPad. And so, you know, we continue to look at Apple's powerful products and 
find ways that we're using them in the classroom and ways that they fit, but their orientation has been, and I think is probably going to continue to be because of market share and money, you know, towards the consumer side. However, that being said, um, as I think Peggy put in, they're, they're listening, um, they're paying attention, and uh, education has always been and still is important to Apple. So I think that, um, you know, there, there are affordances to all kinds of devices. And one of the things we need to do is not be, you know, complete fanboys or girls of, you know, just a particular platform, but really looking at function, becoming app and platform literate, and then selecting the tool that can, you know, best do what we're doing. For instance, we're doing green screen with uh, our Spanish, seventh grade Spanish. Yes, look at that, Miguel. It's your, it's your Apple. I can see the Apple right there as you take a, a selfie. Um, I mean, we're not doing it on a Chromebook, right? We're using green screen by Do Ink, and the, the, the seventh grade kids are, are doing some exciting green screen videos. That's going to be the appropriate tool for, for that task. So we will have to move on to some other topics. People are going to think we are just going to like bash, you know, the, the whole Google Apple thing every time. Am I sounding like a, like a chipmunk again? No, no, you're sounding great. I just noticed that Peggy George <laughs> took a picture of us and put it out there on Twitter. Come on, Peggy. We got day jobs. You can't <laughs> ruin it for us. Okay. Well, um, I'm excited to see that article that Charlene uh, posted, which is awesome. Look at this. The community yeah. of the ed tech situation room, making us all smarter. That's awesome. Uh, because ebooks and the creation of ebooks, I mean, this is, a, this is a huge part of the present and the future is being able to put media into your document, being able to share it at zero, you know, additional cost uh, once you, you know, got it online. Um, and so... It's exciting to see these kinds of experiments, and that's what we need to keep sharing. We've we've got teachers now creating some bilingual ebooks uh, in Spanish and English. Um, it's still hard to figure out how do you share that, you know, in a way that parents can, you know, be right. able to open it. And so, anyway, that may be something that we'll take on too. Okay, should we shift gears? Shift, Let's do shift, it. shift, shift our gears, Miguel. Give us give us one of your articles you'd like to blow our minds with. Uh, just go to mgulen.org or, or better yet, go to speedofcreativity.org. I, I mean, speedofmediocrity.org. Ooh, ooh, he's going to cut what? low. You know, with a single button, Miguel, I could mute. Wait, you. wait, that That's was my okay. old blog That's entry. Okay. No, seriously, give us, give us oh. one of your articles and give us your, your two cents. Or did you just. You put I, your I didn't have any reason. articles. I, oh, I didn't know okay. I was supposed to bring articles. Right. I thought I was just. I, yeah, I, I thought this was a it's traditional okay. kind of interview thing. You know, it you're going to ask me. We're, we're going to roll with the I, I don't have anything. But give me a second, and I will find something. Feedback and you, I, or I, input, and, and you jumped in. Okay, I'm going to do the Microsoft Swift key uh, purchase. So recode on February 2nd. Um, article, Microsoft, Microsoft Swift key purchases about artificial intelligence, not software keyboards. I'm thinking tons about artificial intelligence because I'm still listening to this book um, about the, the Pentagon's brain uh, and DARPA, the Defense uh, Advanced Research Agency. And, you know, just the idea that DARPA is 10 to 20 years ahead of where we are on the consumer side right now should both blow our minds and probably scare us too. I mean, there are, ro there are uh, AI robots <clears throat> on the DMZ in Korea right now, you know, working for the U.S. Army. Um, and anyway, this article is talking about how not Microsoft, and it, like other large companies, you know, is, is able to purchase talent and purchase um, advances and try to incorporate those. And so we have a race between multiple entities when it comes to artificial intelligence. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, Apple is, is in, the, in the mix and Google is in there and we've got Siri and we have uh, Google now and trying to anticipate, you know, things and, and figure stuff out. SwiftKey is trying to anticipate what people are going to type. And uh, I just, I think, you know, this race to artificial intelligence, again, we, in our admin meeting today, we were having discussions about digital citizenship. And sometimes you have things bantered around about how kids just don't think today and they just Google the answers and they lament. But I mean, it's, we're really in the augmented brain era where our brains are not what we're limited by as far as the information that we have and the ways that we can share stuff. So anyway, I, I, I don't know. I think the application here to, to education is, 
you know, how are we changing the questions we're asking? How are we asking kids to do things that you can't just Google? Um, how are we moving beyond assignments that were, you know, relevant 20 years ago? But, you know, how, how do we leverage these tools? I still have yet to really see anybody use Wolfram Alpha or Alpha, whatever however you say it, in, um, in any way in the classroom. And, you know, at uh, Educause, maybe three years ago, I saw the inventor of that. It just blew my mind what that is able to do and information and put it together and the kinds of questions you can ask. So anyway, the whole artificial intelligence thing is, quote, scary, but it also just kind of shows how we are we are on a train headed towards the singularity. And, you know, the phones that we have now are augmenting our brains and we, implantable chips are going to happen. This is all Ian Jukes, you know, kind of stuff that he told us 20 years ago. Um, but it's, you know, now it's a device that's in your hand that you can tell kids to put back in their pocket or their, their purse or their backpack. Um, you know, and we're, we're having trouble adjusting to, to this kind of power. So that's my, that's my AI attempted rant. Well, I would add the one note here that relates to our earlier conversation. Um, this a Swift key used to be a for sale product and then it went free in both the Android store and the iOS store. And it goes back to the notion that, um, you know, if you don't know, if you don't know what they're selling, you're the product. And over time, the reason why this has become such an effective uh, consumer product is because it thinks for you, right? Like it knows that if you're typing, I'm going to the, there's probably only seven or eight options that, that, that might be usable there. And if you type S, it's probably store, right? Or, or some word that you'd use fairly frequently. And, um, you know, that we're, we're just beginning, I think, to tap the notions of, of how logarithms and how big data might impact um, how we engage with one another and how we engage with technology. Um, I think there's a brilliant science fiction novel here about uh, a logarithms and predictive technology and it shut down the stock market and it, it ruined relationships and something, but I, I won't go to the science fiction notion of that tonight, but but um, it's interesting stuff, and it's it's certainly, um, I guess, the, the part of the story that I found most interesting was that Microsoft picked them up for that reason. I would have assumed yeah. that if anyone was going to pick up uh, this company, it'd be Google, because they um, launched on that platform first, and um, essentially, you created the market for alternative keyboards. Um, and, and it's such an effective and, 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 and better keyboard than the stock keyboards that come with any of these devices that I would assume Google, Google would want to pick it up, but I think it helps prove once again, that there's still life left at Microsoft and they are trying as much as possible to stay relevant in the 2016 tech world. I just want to sort of piggyback on what y'all been saying about the, um, there was a phenomenal, uh, fiction book. I, I, I'm trying to find the author. I, I read the whole. There, he wrote two or three books. It was just incredible how drone, drone. They were using drones, uh, building drones and uh, ships, and and shipping them, and and uh, using them to take over the world. Then there was also uh, someone mapped um, all, the entire planet um, as a virtual reality game. And so that made it a uh, possible to um, have the world have things happen in in real life that were happening in virtual. And I think we're quickly moving towards that. And uh, uh, it, it is very frightening. Uh, it, it really makes you want to sort of bury your, t your technology and, and uh, get away from it. But it, there, there's no escape. But you know what's, what's equally frightening is when we walk through schools today and we don't see any of, any of that are kids doing that or, or learning how to do that? What's the on-ramp for uh, kids learning how to do all this stuff? You know, we, we're still dominated by the high stakes tests and everything else and the curriculum. Um, it's like we're, schools are headed in one direction and the world is heading in another. Uh, and to be honest, uh, who's gonna really care about what schools are doing? Well, we're going to need to figure out what to do with our youth, you know, before they can become independent contributors <laughs> to society. So, you know, and sports, Hey, we, you know, I just talked to a friend in Oklahoma city, $2 million cut in this year's OKCPS budget. 
probably six million cut, you know, coming. I mean, oil may go below twenty dollars a barrel. Like Oklahoma's funding was in the toilet when oil was over a hundred dollars. I mean, what's it going to be now when oil is less than thirty? Um, we've, you know, we've got to find ways to to help transform our schools and bring them forward, and you know, encourage innovation and push all of that kind of stuff. And I don't know, I. I think that we're, all, we're we're still not scratching the surface of what social media can do and how we can um, how we can leverage it. I don't know. It it does get depressing thinking about how how things are so slow to change. Um, but that's why it's exciting to go to EdCamp and connect with others online and and connect with educators and see you know how the envelope is being pushed. I mean, this is really important. It's really important to be able to connect like this and encourage other teachers to and uh, you know to see to to be able to see where where people's normal is different than what, what we have uh, because leadership makes a huge difference. And I won't go into the details publicly, but I <clears throat> had a conversation this week that just really reminded me of that. You know, what a big difference it makes when the principal has a vision for, um, yeah, for, for all kinds of good things. And when they don't, you know, what happens, we've all kind of been there with that. So, Hey, if Char Charlene, if you want to come in, we do have another seat. If, if somebody wants to come join in, join our banter we have 25 live people who are joining us on wednesday night that is fantastic and i think we've got actually only about 13 minutes left but we started a little bit late so we'll go a little bit beyond the top of the hour we don't want to cheat you because you've come for a full hour of the edtech situation room and i'm sure we're going to get a lot of hate mail if we would cut it short before <laughs> the full 60 minutes yeah we'd hate to open up the uh situation edtech room mailbag and find nothing but but, but the lack of love so by the way, Google did take our channel offline that I set up, and uh, I don't—I didn't check my email today. But I don't know if it's like against the terms of service to cross-post your own Google Hangout. But I did that, and they—they they took it offline and 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 suspended the channel. So I, I sent a—I ran that across uh, or ran that by Jason the text, and we we protested that. So uh, let's see, we want to. Take another article or two, and then we probably need to do our Geeks of the Week and wrap up. Sure, I could throw one more that's kind of related to this. It seems like we're going to end up on the same rant, the three of us, no matter what. So I'll just throw this in and see what happens. But um, I posted an interesting article from uh, Therot.com. Paul Therot's a longtime Microsoft commentator, and um, he is 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 scratching the surface again of the issue of, of physical media in the digital age. And this has become particularly poignant for me because I um, have been moved a couple of times in the last five years, including a, 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 a town change. Um, I got rid of most of that stuff and prefer now to carry everything either in the cloud or, or on, on some kind of a local backup storage service. And the reason why this article um, presented such an interesting uh, point to me in regards to schools is I think that there's still a big disconnect between purchasing in schools and media in schools. Um, and having been part, I haven't been part of a textbook committee in, in, in over six years um, because I now work in, in an all in in digital environment, but um, it's interesting to watch schools find their way through this process um, first, because of how much more expensive uh, digital media has become, and unlike the, the personal realm where you can often buy a, a, an album on iTunes or on Google Play cheaper than you could the physical media, whereas textbooks, which oftentimes have six, eight, ten year lifespans, whether it's for the good of the students or not, um, you know, if you're, you're, if you're paying um, 100 120 150 dollars for that textbook, you're actually getting a much better bargain than if you attempt to pay 30 50 90 100 dollars to buy a year's license to a similar text. And so um, I was curious to see what you two had to say about this in regards to, you know, what schools should be doing. Does this mean a movement towards OER? Does it mean we need to um, uh, better encourage publishers to find uh, better models for this? Should we abandon textbooks altogether, which was what 2010 Jason would have said um, in the, my last time in a classroom that the textbook is probably not the worth the worth the money we're paying for it anyways. Um, so I throw that question out: uh, physical media in schools today. I think physical media is the only uh, choice that many of our our libraries have uh, because of the digital rights management. And uh, if we did not have digital rights management, there would be tons of content, and we could share it and and take advantage of it. There's a lot of uh, tools, uh, OverDrive, although it's locked down like crazy, but it is the only legal 
choice. There's uh, something called Bibliotech in our area, which allows us to uh, check out um, eBooks, and those that is a wonderful option for our middle school and our high school uh, students. But uh, aside from those two options, uh, if you want to get eBooks, you have to go find them online. Uh, there's lots of free sources available, and when I say free, I mean free and legal sources. But there's also the others um, that are available. But uh, DRM is such a pain. You know, we want to provide access to content in a variety of uh, media formats, but we just can't do it as long as DRM is, is in the way. Let's just get past that. Let's do a subscription model and, and uh, then open it up. But uh, on the other side of that is uh, if you're an author and your books are not protected by DRM, uh, well, what's that guy's name? Paulo Co Coelho? Co Coelho? He, he, he pirated his own books, put them out there, and increased his readership. Wes, have, have you done that with your books? You, you should. Uh, pirate some of your own books, release them as uh, unprotected uh, EPUBs, and I bet you, your readership would go up tremendously. And he first, noticed, first, I have to update my 2011 book that talks about postures. So <laughs> well, you could just release it as sort of a sample of, of the awesome quality writing that you have, and, and uh, people would, would just take that out there. So uh, DRM is the main obstacle. I, I like the idea of, of physical books. We are still going to accumulate content and stuff. If your shelves aren't full of books, they're going to be full of something else. But it, it's just, um, I mean, I have thousands of books. My, my digital collection is way bigger than what it ever was, um, but it, it is less imposing. And the other part of this is that the uh, e-readers that are available, I mean, I can read on my phone, start reading on my phone, move to an Amazon Kindle Fire, and the Kindle Fire that I only paid $30 for works wonderful, much better than that super expensive iPad that I had. Um, and who cares? I mean, I can read on Android. It, it, it's just a wonderful... Uh, I want to read great stories, and uh, that's why I read Wes Fryer stuff. And, I mean, that's not oh, what I was going to say. You're going to get kicked off if you keep saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to mute you. Um, so Chris Worley has said, talked about Overdrive and 3M being available for books at our libraries. Charlene yeah. is here and some other real ebook gurus. Um, I would love to know more about um, how schools are curating ebooks that are being created by teachers and students beyond iTunes U. Of course, you could do that, but how you can share it. I agree with Miguel that DRM can be an obstacle, but I also think we just have a lot of headspace to work with and work beyond when it comes to that purchase of curriculum and, and the idea of open digital sharing and OER. I think it's a big deal. We talked last, last week about uh, you know, kind of the announcement of uh, the, was it Maker? What was it the White House has done, I guess? Oh, it was Hour of Code. And right. the fact that we've got, right. you know, some high level support for some of these initiatives and the, the White House has come out in support of open educational resources. I think every uh, state level education department should be advocating for this when they release grants, asking for things to be licensed under open licenses. But I'm reminded of being back in Texas, uh, you know, in, in the in the mid to late 90s. I don't remember when this happened, Miguel, but when they changed that definition of instructional materials so that it no longer only could be the, the paper based text, but it could open it up to, you know, other kinds of digital materials. So many teachers are 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 still very they we feel naked without the textbook. Right. And without that that curriculum and. Um, I don't know. I think we have a long way to go with that. So we need people to share more. We need more. Um, we need more generous sharing. I'm, we're going to have a conference in November next year, the first Friday and Saturday at our school called the Digital Sharing Conference. And I've got to start getting my marketing things out for that. But <clears throat> the idea is let's help teachers set up channels to be able to share and build that into the culture of what we do in school. You know, we share student work, but we also share lesson ideas and there's space to monetize and there's places and ways to do that if we want to monetize. But I don't know. I think that the, 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 the way in which we hold on to the textbook and some teachers, when we say we're moving away from it, just you think it's a death knell. Oh my gosh, you can't take my textbook. 
well, actually, we could look at blending content from PBS learning media and and digital streaming from, you know, Discovery and I mean YouTube and there's and there's just so much content. And um, I think a lot of times teachers are in places where they don't have autonomy and they're not able to, you know, craft that kind of and time. We're all limited in time. So uh, I think it's a huge issue. And we need to find ways to reach those decision makers who are buying those textbooks and who are also setting the policy for things like grants and try to open the door to, you know, more flexible, a more flexible look at media. So there's my two cents. All right. I think we need Geeks of the Week, and we're probably going to need to to wrap it up, unless there's another article that just jumps out. But I think Geeks of the Week will be good. Yeah, I did throw the one in there, uh, Wes, for you. I hope you got it. Uh, the one with uh, Paolo Coelho. Coelho. I don't know how to say that, but he's he's encouraging people to pirate their own books. So okay. Did you put it on the on the Google Doc? I did not. I put it in the chat. Okay. I will. We'll copy it over. So yeah. that's good. I hadn't heard that. And you know what? I mean, here we are doing this webcast. I mean, oftentimes a book recommendation from someone is is a more transformative thing than than just about anything. So I, I value those greatly. And I miss my friend Bob Sprinkle, who was always reading something very challenging. And you know, those those kind of things are good too. So if you have any suggestions for us on the EdTech Situation Room, which by the way, Jason, we will not be here next week. Is that correct? That's correct. So I know Although we've built everyone's excitement up for oh, right the week after however um i will be broadcasting live from seattle and uh a good time to plug the northwest council for computer education conference uh two weeks from now in fabulous seattle washington there's just 19 spots left in the google summit that i'll be hosting at ncc awesome okay so chris is saying he wants to hear more about uh centralo or centralio uh and Maybe I don't know. I'm not finding the link. So maybe Miguel, after we sign off, you can uh, just drop it in the Google Doc for the discussion links. So let's do some geeks of the week. Um, I'll go first. Um, I put a awesome tweet that Ben Wilkoff shared, and that is I didn't know this, and I guess it's been around a while. You can blur faces in the YouTube editor, uh, and uh, I put the tweet in there. He kind of has has a nice step by step of of how you go into I guess it's in enhancements and then you can click on blurring effects and uh, choose faces and apply. So that's pretty cool. There's ways that you can do that on the iPad, but it's definitely not as fast. And then I put the link in for you on the, uh, Oh, Miguel, you put your picture in there. That's good. Yeah. yeah, Be quiet. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) It's gone. Watching our Google doc is so exciting during these uh, live shows. The Wi-Fi. Stay on message. Stay on message. Hopefully no one at your school is bringing a script kitty hacking device, but uh, these things actually can be really problematic. And <clears throat> I think they can very quickly generate, you know, different kinds of attacks that, that break the law. And uh, I'm not recommending anyone get one. Like I said, we read a, a Cisco Meraki uh, workshop and they were talking about, you know, countering threats and how you know what's happening on your network and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> And uh, anyway, part of our job to bring this to the K-12 is how do we find those kids that are, you know, a possible hacker to come over to the to the to the from the dark side to be a white hat and use their skills for good and not for evil and maybe identify vulnerabilities that we have in our network or, you know, help, you know, write code for, you know, apps that we're doing at school or whatever. But there's that that's an enduring need that we're going to have. Uh, for our nation, I didn't put the article in, but I think President Obama announced something about cybersecurity and really trying to push towards, you know, trying to ramp that up. We need kids with geek skills to, you know, go to college and or, or go to training and be able to apply those skills to um, help us. So anyway, those are my geeks of the week. Great. Who wants to go next? I'll jump in. Um, two two things to share this week. Um, the first one, by the way, I've seen a white Wi-Fi pineapple, um, and they're um, amusing and terrifying all wrapped into one. So um, first, I want to share another podcast. I mean, you probably don't need to go beyond this podcast, frankly, for your news or information. That's all you need. Um, but but let's say <laughs> let's say you have other desires in the educational world. Um, I've been listening to the, uh, the last couple of months, Horizontal Transfer, which happens to feature a, a Montana guy, Paul Anderson, the 2011 Montana Teacher of the Year, who is now um, uh, 
uh, an educational consultant and doing a lot of work in professional development, uh, has joined up with uh, David Nufke, I believe is how you pronounce his name. He's an AP biology teacher in New York, and they do a really great podcast that's basically two teachers talking about stuff important to teachers. And what I love about it is it is focused on on their particular content area. They were uh, both AP biology teachers, um, but um, I'm certainly not an AP biology teacher, and I've every week really enjoyed the conversation and banter back and forth as I talk through some of these sticky issues of how to teach kids um, in a modern and, and digital era. So that's horizontaltransfer.com, and it's a great podcast that I think is worth your um, you know 20 to 30 minutes a week. Um, and the second thing I want to highlight is that um, there is a um, um, a website that I actually got asked about on Twitter this week that um, I mentioned a couple weeks ago that that I had bought some old um, refurbished um, uh, computers that updated to Windows 10. I was really happy with them, even though they're really old. Like where I'm finding old refurbished computers at, and the answer for me is Woot. Woot.com is the website that I buy more junk than I care to say at. Um, but I've been able to, for both family members and um, as a um, um, uh, personal edification, I guess, um, more ridiculous junk for my house. Um, I've been able to buy a lot of great stuff at Whoop, the old refurbished laptops, for example, for projects and such. So uh, whoops.com. Awesome. All right, Miguel, take us out with Geek of the Week. Yeah. So um, I had not heard of Office Lens. Uh, have you all heard of Office Lens? Okay. Is that, so is, you, that, you, is, that, is that the one that uh, shows you the different languages when you hold it up? Well, that's no, no. I don't remember what that one's called, but uh, I don't know about it. So in light, since I'm multilingual, I don't need it that one as much. But the uh, <laughs> <laughs> but Office Lens is phenomenal. I was sitting at a TCA uh, conference, and and one of the presenters, uh, Bruce Ellis, mentioned it just off the cuff. It, it wasn't even about that, and I do not remember anything that he shared about the new uh, Texas appraisal system because I was focused on this app. I was taking pictures of his slides, and I was like at a maybe 45-degree angle from the screen, and when I took pictures, what it does is it flattens it out, and uh, it's it's just uh, – you got to try it. It's, it's amazing. The other um, time that I I was sitting next to a guy uh, – we were li listening to Eric Scheninger at uh, – uh, at, at a luncheon and there was a guy riding on an iPad Pro and he was snapping pictures and I said, hey, you've got to try this Office Lens app. And so he, he uh, started doing it. It was like he was just amazed because it flattens the picture out. It looks like you're uh, straight on looking at it, just sort of like we are now. And uh, just a phenomenal. And it works with everything. I, I, I snapped a picture of a squirrel. Uh, it works great as a, as a scanning tool. Squirrel, squirrel. That's right, exactly. The second, uh, so if you haven't tried it, it's wor definitely worth trying out. Um, and I've included the links to the iOS and Android uh, in the Google Doc. Now, I don't know if you all know, but I've been on uh, a search for a replacement to Evernote. Why do, I, why do I want to replace Evernote? I don't know. It, it's, it's just clunky. It, it doesn't work. The, search, the searches, the only thing I can do is put content into it, and uh, it's, it's not as fun to get content out of it. And they really sort of got me mad when they got rid of RSS feeds, uh, and uh, I've been looking ever since. So I've tried a whole slew of them. I've tried uh, Apple Notes. Uh, I forgot the name of the guy. Google, Google Keep. You tried Google Keep? Oh, yeah. But Google Keep is great for a short little grocery list. But I'm talking about storing documents. It's sort of uh, – I don't like to throw stuff into Google Drive because it sort of disappears. But uh, you can put stuff in um, uh, Evernote, and you've got access to it. Well – I'm, I was looking for something similar, something that has lists of lists embedded in them and notes and all of that. And Centralo was one that I just got an email out of the blue. It's one of those press releases that y'all get. And you know what I'm talking about. Everybody sends you press releases. And uh, I usually don't read them. I automatically delete them. But um, this one jumped out at me, and uh, I started playing with it, and it's it really works. It's uh, The other part of it, I was, I was about to fall asleep because uh, it was – you know, it was about this time. It was way past my bedtime, and I was. Uh, I said, I'm just going to send in a support ticket. You know, it, it. I'm trying to import Evernote. It's not working. What's going on? The co-founder, uh, Michael, uh, I forgot his last name. I think it's Michael Schur, S-H-I-R. 
um, he uh, responded within, I mean, it was less than 24 hours and uh, worked through the problem and we were able to get everything taken care of and I was able to export my Evernote, import into Centralo. You've got to check it out. It works on all your devices, uh, Android, iOS, on the web. Very easy to use. Um, it's sort of like what Evernote used to be maybe, but not really. It, it it's I think it's a little bit better than that. And it's, um, I don't know, definitely worth so trying out. I even you, took some pictures and posted that too. You heard it first here on the EdTech Situation Room. The cool kids are not using Evernote. And here that just shows what kind of group I'm in because I'm, I'm still using it. So uh, we'll, go around one, <laughs> we'll go around one more time, tell everybody where they can find you online. And um, then I think we'll probably wrap up. And this has been awesome. We have 28 folks. And thanks to Peggy for dropping in so many links and uh, the questions. And, and this has been great. So, Jason, where do people find you online? I am on Twitter at Tech Savvy Teach, and I blog fairly regularly at the NCC Tech Savvy Teacher blog, blog.ncce.org. And if you have not been to NCCE, it is an amazing conference, and anytime you can get to the Pacific Northwest, you know, is a good, it's it's good, good stuff. Miguel, where are we you? We can promise you rain. That's right. You'll you probably get wet. How about you, Miguel? Where are you digitally sharing these days? You can find me at uh, www.mguhlin.org. And as soon as I can put two cents together, I'm going to get speedofmediocrity.net. There you go. Or is it that .com? Sounds, that I, bet I, I bet I can sell dot stuff. .us, dot .me. You could just do all kinds of things. Yeah, I've got mgulin.us. Oh, and I've got... nin dot .ninja is available. Good. Oh, wow. <laughs> So I'm at speedofcreativity.org. I am W. Fryer on Twitter. And we are the EdTech Situation Room, your now almost weekly show. And we will, for the record, not be back next week. So please do not tune in on February 17th. But we will be back on February the 24th with yet another exciting show. And who knows, we may even have more than one guest. And we may be able to start on time. But, you know. The tech, it, it worked. We just had to go to some different devices to, to get it to all work. Thanks for having me on board. This is my first Blab ever and uh, very informative. I'm planning to use it. Uh, so thank you for the tutorial. You blabbed well and you exceeded all expectations with over 280 uh, applause. Yeah, stop clicking. Stop Look clicking. Everyone, Wes, give, I can see yeah, you're clicking. Give Miguel stop. love. Guys, we pushed him over 300. Oh my gosh. Goal. He is. Let's the break man. 500. Come on. He's the man. All right. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Okay. Have fun. Over and out.